So my name is Jeff Rommel. I'm the Associate Dean of Physical Science, and my uh, expertise is in mathematics, although some people question that, but nevertheless. Um, Phil asked me to put together a panel to um, talk about uh, what we might do in educational initiatives. One of the things that I've been trying to talking with various people over the past uh, couple of years is I felt that we don't have a systematic way of training data sciences on campus. It's, it's, it's not an easy problem to solve, partly because um, we can all agree that, well, you should know some statistics, you should know some machine learning, you should know some, some stuff about the current software and hardware platforms and that sort of stuff. But then there's, of course, the domain knowledge that you really need to, to go on and do something in your particular area. Um, the other problem that we have on campus is one where we have, as you've just seen uh, with the last presentation and some of the presentations this morning, we have this enormous amount of expertise sitting in the supercomputer center and, and <coughs> Cal IT2, but you know, those are mostly people in research positions and the question is how do you get them to teach and, and, and that sort of thing. So the idea of this panel is I'm going to ask each of the individuals to um, talk for just a, a couple of minutes about the kinds of, of educational initiatives that have been going on either in their divisions or um, t together with, with other uh, people on campus um, to, to give you the information about what sort of things that people have been thinking about now. And the hope is that we will have time at the end to get other people's point of view because I think this is one of the things that we really need to push forward at UCSD uh, if we're going to be on the map in data science. So I'm going to start out um, with Chayton, because I think you're the only person that has slides. <laughs> All right. Um, is it from here? Or? or you can do it either way. <clears throat> so before I get started with the slides, I, so I'm totally energized and jazzed today because of this thing. So there was a TEDx event yesterday at my kids' uh, school, Canyon Crest Academy. Some of you might have children there. They had their TEDx, and uh, and I was on the crew, so I've been there since 5 a.m. to 7 p.m. yesterday. The only difference between these two badges is, so see all the social media there, and Phil, this is our badge. Okay. <laughs> so the thing I wanted to say about that is, one of the speakers yesterday was uh, Jack Andraka. You should look up Jack if you don't know him. Uh, he's a junior in high school right now in Maryland. Um, he won the Intel Award when he was a sophomore. Uh, when he was a freshman, he came up with an idea for uh, early diagnosis of cancer. Um, and, he was, and how did he get to it? He started doing some Google search and Wikipedia. So to me, that's actually big data. So a big part of what big data is sort of new data, or in the sense, new thinking about data that may already be there. So here's a kid who really didn't have much of a background. He had some ideas that he was picking up, did a Google search, went to Wikipedia, uh, came up with an idea, and then here comes the next part that I'm sure you're all familiar with. He wrote 200 letters to 200 different researchers um, at Johns Hopkins University and at NIH. He got 199 rejections, including some faculty who wrote in very detail as to why his idea will never work. There was one faculty who picked him up at Johns Hopkins and now he's got a sub dollar or some a few cents worth test for early stage pancreatic cancer, which he thinks connects into other things, and um, uh, he's patenting it. But it was interesting. Uh, the last third or so of his talk was actually about open science. He was complaining about how dif difficult it is to get hold of journals. And it's only if you're in these elite institutions, big universities, NIH, et cetera, that you can actually get to read articles. He had to pay thousands of dollars to read papers. And he's a kid, he still doesn't know uh, things that we've been started thinking about, which is open data. So I think that's where it's all going. So anyway, I thought I'll give you that. So let me now uh, say a little bit about my slides, um, which is this. Uh, oh, that's the other one, it's the other one. The other one. I don't know what I did with this. Sorry. <laughs> I must probably exploded something outside. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. Um, I want to introduce to you a, a new initiative that we're in the process of uh, actually rolling out even as we speak, which we're calling the Institute for Data Science and Engineering. That's out of SDSC. Uh, you heard already quite a bit about SDSC. So one of the things that SDSC has done over the years is put together a number of projects that all involve data 
in one way or the other. They cross a lot of dis different disciplines, uh, from proteomics to ocean sciences to ecology, uh, geosciences, even computer science, networking, etc. Um, and some of these are small, some of these are, are big efforts. Um, and on the other side, we have a whole bunch of resources, again, that you heard about, everything from uh, the old days of TerraGrid, which was about I don't know, 10 years ago. Now we have Exceed. You heard about all the big resources we have. The magic that puts all of that together, also you heard about, are the expertise that's at SDSC. So in the middle, uh, are not actually, it's not an exhaustive list, but it's a fairly complete list of all of the labs that are at SDSC that represent researchers. On the other side, SDSC has also done a lot of training and education. Okay, so we have Natasha, uh, Natasha's uh, boot camps on data mining from the PACE. Uh, SDSC runs, oh, I can see here, SDSC runs summer institutes. For a while, it's been doing this on parallel computing. Last This year, our emphasis was big data. Um, for a number of years, starting in 2004, I've been running the Cyber Infrastructure Summer Institute for Geoscientists. Interestingly, that idea was given to us uh, when Dr. Margaret Leinen was at NSF, and she said, you know, you guys should run something like this. And now she's here at SIO. Um, and this year, we ran the EarthCube Summer Institute for Technology Exploration. Again, it shows you who all of these are targeted to. So the PACE are targeted to industry professionals, summer institutes of, for, for graduate students and faculty, postdocs. Uh, the uh, Earth Science Institutes are, of course, targeted to uh, geoscientists and earth scientists. We also have efforts in K through 12 kinds of education. So if you both put both of those two slides together, there's expertise and project experience at SDSC and there's training and education, um, not just expertise, but a lot of interest. Our folks at SDSC are very interested to work with scientists and actually provide this kind of training. <clears throat> that got us to thinking about a particular niche that uh, is uh, unserved and, and is open right now, which is the notion of uh, folks who are professionals already in, in their jobs or scientists doing their work who want to pick up some of these data science skills. Um, I've been talking to some companies like, uh, you know, heads of analytics for, of companies like, say, Target and uh, Sears, et cetera. One of the things they actually value is the knowledge that the, their current employees have about the domain. And what they rather prefer is to keep that knowledge and train those folks on data science and engineering rather than the other way around. That is, to hire somebody who's a data scientist and then try to teach them the business, okay? But these guys all have day jobs. So the idea that we had was to have these short format courses that we would offer one day, two day courses. A bunch of them could be put together to create a one week uh, sort of offering. Uh, and people would not be too much disrupted from their day-to-day -day work and, and get trained. Uh, this would be contracts with, at the organizational level. So we'd go to companies and drop a contract at the company level. Uh, it, would be in, it could potentially be institute training. We can go to, to the site. Uh, and it also needs to be a continuous engagement because data science is changing rapidly. It's not just learning one thing once. Actually, as you learn more, you realize you need to know more. And so it's a continuous engagement. Uh, thematic areas in this would be the end-to-end -end analytics lifecycle, uh, predictive analytics and modeling, once you've got control of all your data, uh, information visualization, certainly, uh, big data management, uh, as well as data, big data systems. Um, and it would be complementary to other education and training programs here, such as the UCSD extension and the computer science department is putting out an MAS program in data science and engineering. So, I won't go through the, the you know, there's a bunch of folks at SDSC, some of whom you've heard from today, uh, you know, who represent a lot of experience and expertise. So they form the uh, faculty for this. But also, by the way, this is meant to be very open and collaborative. So we do understand that there are data science experts on this campus, everywhere from physics uh, to SIO. And they could be part of this, offering some of their uh, one, or day, one or two day uh, modules as part of this. So I expect that there'd be a core set of things that we'd have to teach everybody and then specialized modules depending on you know, what the customer or the uh, attendee wants to learn. Finally, there is an education and training tab on the big data website. Uh, so I was asked to bring your, uh, your attention to that. If you go to the community tab, click on educational opportunities and we'll put this up there and everybody is welcome to put whatever might be relevant information there.
Oh, next slide. This one? There is another one here. Okay. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm, I'm happy to express my total ignorance of big data. Uh, it's not the area I work in. But I do work in building institutions. That's my job. And <clears throat> as a department, in fact, you should say driving change diligently. Um, we hire people for their lifetime, and we build programs that will last generations, and they will create talent for generations. So what I wanted to do today is to give you our thinking in this area as to how we have been going about building this program, and also relate to you the challenges we face you will notice I'm not using the word big data here. Um, the big tends to be relative, but we, I'm gonna do is give you a quick snapshot of the department or the institution. We basically have 20,000 students in our classes. We're not talking about online classes, we're talking about real classes. And um, 2,000 undergraduate students, about 400 graduate students. So it's a relatively large department. The part that I will draw your attention to is if you look at our faculty, um, and if you go towards the bottom of this uh, list of uh, faculty, uh, we have six faculty members in machine learning, six in systems, and three in databases. We are still looking for the talent nationwide. But if you pull them all together, that's one, th one third of our department, more than one third of our department, that is in, at the intersection of the topics that are being discussed today. So that's the department we have built. Um, it's also a department that is on a roll. In fact, I just took a, a, a cut from our last review of our graduate program. No computer science program in the nation, in the nation, has made, made greater progress than UCSD in the past 15 years. We were the rocket, and we are the rocket going, going uh, raise, uh, rising very fast. Uh, some of the uh, faculty and the, and the affiliates um, have actually been making news in this area. In fact, this lab on chip, not lab on chip, but rack on chip was in science recently, in October of Science Magazine. So this department definitely that is on a roll. We have, uh, I'm told, the only uh, center funded by NIH in a, entirely in a computer science department on mass spectrometry. So inspired by all these talent that we had put together uh, two years ago, we launched a campaign, we call it Inspiring Imagination Campaign, with the singular goal of, of increasing the hands-on learning experience by undergraduates. And that, that, uh, that Inspiring Imagination Campaign definitely continues with, with quite a bit of success. And so this is the snapshots of the, the, uh, the spaces we are building. We are also in online, but with our own strengths. So for example, as I speak to you, Paul Provisioner is teaching uh, with Philip Campbell and Nicola Vahi a course with 16,000 students in the class where these students are also doing research with algorithms in, in bioinformatics. So that begs the question, so what are we doing in data science and engineering? Uh, there have been many references to, uh, to master's or advanced studies program. In a couple slides, I will give you an overview of what that program looks like. But we have quite a few active faculty. Some of them are in the audience here uh, in the department and across the, the department. We definitely had the pleasure to work with Ilkay here, Natasha, Chaitan, Amarnath, and Phil, and many more to, to have a, a good set of over a dozen uh, faculty and researchers who sort of have been defining the content of what will go into big data educational initiatives. We have several courses. <clears throat> this I don't intend you to read. I certainly cannot read. I think the word big data is highlighted in some places. But basically, intellectually, it goes across areas of probability, statistics, statistics machine learning, um, and, and data analytics. One of the things that is very close to my heart in, in putting this together is a class of courses, and in fact, hopefully degree programs going forward, that are what I call mezzanine courses. And these are the courses where senior undergraduates and graduates are co-located in the same space and in the same classroom. And a number of courses have been proposed in that area. So that's just flipping through some of these classes. Let me <clears throat> say a little bit about the Master's of Advanced Studies program. Uh, quite frankly, Master's of Advanced Studies is a program that was designed for a very specific audience, mostly working professional who may not have the time 
to sit through the classes Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or, or through the week, um, but have time over the weekends and maybe Fridays, and, and may have quite a bit of working experience. So we pulled together uh, a, a team and proposal in 2011, that's how long it takes. We have already been three and a half years into formulating this program. We fielded a proposal to Academic Senate in April uh, this year, uh, and then we got back comments and we revised it and updated it. We also had it national uh, reviews of this. And right now, as I speak to you, we are somewhere, um, we are actually pending towards, uh, we have given it to CCGA, which is some committee at the, at the uh, system-wide level. And, and we are waiting for their approvals. So as I speak to you, the campus, hopefully the Academic Senate, does its own due diligence in time for us to launch this program in, in, in fall of coming year. And what is this program about? This program has three core courses um, related to Python for data analytics, data management systems, and, um, and uh, statistics and probability using Python. And from those, and actually not core courses, but foundation courses, there are four core courses, then there are a bunch of uh, optional courses, and so you have to look at it, you have about 10 to 11 courses with a capstone project. That's what makes a solid training in big data. So that is the program for, for students and talent that has been around, maybe has seen the experience. What about the 2,000 undergraduates we have? So our faculty has been very active. In fact, I see Charles in the audience, and, and Charles took the initiative to actually put together a program for minor in, 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 in analytics. And as things happen, things in the academic environment happen at glacial spaces. And some of us, including me, get very impatient with this thing. But I have no doubt going forward that both undergraduate program will see a substantial uh, um, not only content, but also students and, and the programs that will uh, add to our, our intellectual breadth we have. So that is, in short, the, the scope of things we are, we are pursuing in big data. And definitely, you see the names, and, and you're welcome to contact them. Thank you. Uh, I'm Michael Holst. I'm a professor in the math department. Um, I, uh, it was suggested that I say a few words about our computational science, mathematics, engineering program that we started uh, in 2007. <clears throat> this, uh, this program is uh, an interdisciplinary graduate program. It started as a doctoral program uh, in 2007, and we then later added a year later a master's uh, program, which I won't really talk about. Um, so what the program is, and uh, and sort of I'll maybe describe the vision of where, where we uh, plan to take it, uh, is uh, it's basically a, an integrated graduate doc doctoral program that uh, a student that comes into one of the science or engineering departments takes as a sort of a specialization track in their graduate studies. In fact, it's uh, a formal UC specialization, which is sort of like a minor to a PhD in the UC system. And so the way it works, uh, there are three participating uh, physical science departments, three participating engineering departments. And the way it works is you're admitted into the doctoral program in your home department. And you're a, a doctoral student in that home department in every sense uh, of any other student in that department. But then you're also admitted, uh, you, you apply and then are admitted if uh, the executive committee of the program uh, feels you meet the uh, prerequisites for the program, you're admitted also into this specialization. And then along with your normal graduate uh, requirements, you complete this additional year of training in computational science. And you know, computational science is a big, a big area, so we focused on uh, training students in a very limited uh, way, and I, all we have is a year of courses, uh, in doing simulation of physical systems involving differential equations. So we first train them a little bit in, in uh, uh, how, you, how you describe physical systems with differential equations, how you develop numerical methods for simulation, how you deploy those numerical methods on modern architectures, uh, supercomputers, uh, mainly now massively parallel computers. And then the final quarter of that sequence, there's a sort of a degree of flexibility that allow the student to specialize in a particular domain area in addition to their standard training in a particular domain uh, science. Um, now, uh, it's interesting to listen to this conversation that I've been uh, witnessing today, and Chaitan's talk in particular is very interesting to me because I remember hearing 
a very similar talk or several, several discussions 20, 25 years ago, but the words computational science were you being used instead of data science. So at that time, every few months you would hear about a new uh, university, uh, one of the leading research universities would be developing a new computational science PhD program. And it would either be a standalone department or maybe something integrated with existing departments. And at that time, it was uh, interesting to, to see that you know the, the field itself is still evolving. It wasn't clear how you train someone in computational science. You create a new department. Do you? But at the same time, you need to have they need to have domain knowledge to be able to leverage computational science. So um, different places created things in different ways. Um, one of the reasons I went to the University of Illinois was because they had just created such an entity. And in fact, uh, Larry Smarr was the founding director of NCSA at that time. Mike Norman was there as a leading computational physicist, and then uh, also Shankar Subramaniam was there at that time. So it's interesting that they're all, all here now. Um, so anyway, what, what we've seen over the last five years as we, we finally created a program here that helps train some of our students, but we've seen the field move, and now computational science has really become something else. It's really what you might call data-enabled computational science or data-enabled simulation. And so uh, we, we're sort of rethinking the way we design the computational science program, and we're uh, trying to build in uh, a training leg that would allow, again, in a very limited way, uh, in the sort of year-long sequence that we have access to, uh, so that we don't disrupt the domain science training that they already do, to try to give the students uh, a basic uh, set of tools for drawing uh, science out of the simulations and experimental data that they have access to as scientists. So, so that's where we're headed, and uh, we're sort of in the middle of that conversation right now. We hope to have something uh, ready to roll out next fall. So, I'm Hugo Villar. I'm with UC San Diego Extension. Extension is the continuing education branch for the university. And every year, last year, we trained around 23,000 students uh, on different topics that range from the liberal arts topics like history and humanities all the way to hardcore sciences. Among those topics, uh, people come to us for different personal reasons. Some of them come to us for personal enrichment. Some of them come to us because they have uh, reached a point in their careers where they need additional training. Some of these people are PhDs, they have master's degrees, but they feel that they have stagnated, particularly given the rapid progress in science and technology, as well as in the humanities. Uh, the third type of people that we typically serve are people who are in transition in their careers. Most professionals don't realize that they will be having, if they work in the industry, an average of five career changes. And every time that you have a career change, that means that you need to be retrained in something. And that's the function that we fulfill. So in some of those cases, the the needs of that population can be served by information, and we run UCTV, which most of you have in your uh, cable. And in next month, we will be recording a program specifically on big data, so it will be coming out at some point uh, in the near future. So some people are satisfied with information. Others need to have some training in specific tools, like, for example, GIS, biostatistics, healthcare analytics that we offer courses and certificates on. And of course, then there is the third leg for which they should come back to the university, which is when they need full education on a particular topic. So um, our focus is typically on workforce development. And because of that, we spend an inordinate amount of time talking to the companies out there. And uh, we have had corporate education programs where we take big data programs into companies. Recently, we took a big data uh, program to one of the largest big data employers here um, on social media as well as uh, text analytics. And uh, so we do um, a lot of corporate education. We have a number of certificates, some of which have been uh, associated with big data, including a certificate on data mining that was started by Dr. Natasha Balak, and she's one of our advisors, but we also pull information from companies around here as to what the real needs are of the employees that they have. 
We have certificates on biostatistics, on GIS, on many programming languages that are needed uh, for people who are trying to get into these areas. Some people come with a PhD in biology and all of a sudden they want to apply their knowledge to healthcare analytics. So they need some additional tools. They can come to us and do that. We run a program on terrestrial carbon accounting, which is a mix of GIS that we run together with the WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, in the summer, which was very well received and had attendance from all over the planet. Um, so we have a lot of um, background and information and tools that are available to the students as well as to the researchers. And for the researchers, the message is that we are a bridge to the community. We can very easily connect your expertise to a need in the community and try to identify an educational opportunity for whatever information is that you're willing to deliver. The other area where we specialize is in innovation. We have a lot of flexibility as to what is that we can do to deliver courses. So we have courses that are in the form of workshops. We have been running workshops with uh, the San Diego Supercomputer Center. We just run one on Hadoop and PMML. And uh, those are topics that uh, have a lot of information uh, that are available to people. Uh, so our approach starts with a need from the community, and from that need, we try to fulfill uh, what we perceive is the actual need from the, uh, that we can bring out into the community. All right, I'm Karsten Hansen from the Rady School, and I'll be brief since we have a little bit of a time crunch. Um, let me just say a few things about some of the initiatives we're looking at uh, at the Rady School under the heading of data analytics. Uh, essentially, they're all driven by the same idea that a modern business school can no longer afford to graduate uh, MBA students that don't have some knowledge of data analytics. Um, and so, on, on Amir, who is one of my colleagues in the marketing group here, and I have been running a um, projects course this fall called Data Analytics in the Wild where we're basically we're sending out MBA students into companies and work on the company data on a data analytics project. It's been a huge success. I mean, we were literally buried under an avalanche, I guess not literally, but almost um, by contact from companies. I mean, they're so hungry for this. And so we had to turn companies away to actually be involved in this, uh, in this uh, course. And we're gonna expand it next year, hopefully, and turn it into a two quarter course. And basically to start sort of training MBA students in some of these methods. Um, we're also uh, looking into uh, starting a master's program in business analytics uh, that's still on the drawing board. We're talking about making a center, uh, just basically driven by this idea that there are so many companies out there that they want to work with us. We need to create an outlet for that to happen. And you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be here all, here all day. I'm happy to talk to other people who have interests in working with enterprise company data uh, because the, the demand is out there and we just have to sort of make it happen. Um, okay. Hi, I'm John Arkin. I'm gonna talk real briefly about uh, a few things. The, uh, this is a global network that's being established, Ocean Observatories Initiative uh, in the oceans, of course, by the National Science Foundation. Uh, and we telemeter back data back in near real time by cables off the coast of, uh, of Washington and Oregon and by satellite from uh, the higher latitudes in the, uh, in the ocean. The architecture is such that we are transmitting uh, data back and forth and commanding and controlling the platforms that are at sea uh, using a messaging system called AMQP. Uh, we have uh, a variety of uh, areas in the US in our 10 gigabit network, uh, which extends out into the ocean, as I showed you a little bit earlier. We have various distribution points at which our uh, message passing system actually uh, becomes part of the uh, large-scale internet. We're delivering uh, substantial amounts of data every year uh, on the order of petabytes uh, through this um, system. 
and uh, we're providing broad open access to uh, in near, with near real time data to anyone that's interested in using this. One of the things that's just happening now is there are three autonomous vehicles in the Gulf of Alaska uh, enjoying the weather out there, and we're seeing first light on those uh, those instruments uh, for the first time. Wait, I'm teaching a class right now for the first time it's ever been taught at Scripps called Scientific Computing. Um, it's unusual and it's the largest class that I know of that's ever been at Scripps. It has about 29 PhD students, uh, biologists, oceanographers, geophysicists, geologists, and so on, all trying to learn a bit about programming. And uh, they are working on a project at the end of the uh, quarter right now uh, on working with these new data that are just now available from uh, the systems at sea. But it's an unusual class. It's uh, broad. They're not there. They're there to uh, learn how to apply uh, programming to systems like the human genome, uh, geophysics, uh, tsunami warning, tsunami studies, and so on. And more than uh, about 60% of the class are women, which I don't see often at many of the classes in computer sciences around the campus. So. Uh, these are people that are very invested in their careers, and uh, computing is becoming a bigger and bigger part of that. Uh, we're using uh, lots of data. I wouldn't call it big data in the sense of NSA and Amazon. We try to organize it extraordinarily well, feed it into uh, models, assimilate data, thereby creating a, generally a threefold increase in the amount of information that's available. Thank you very much. So I'll just say a couple of words because we ran out of time. But um, what we really uh, would like people to think about, like to get people's feedback on, is we think that we need some sort of both undergraduate training as, as the kind of minor that we're talking about to have students um, be able to go into various aspects of applications of, of data analytics and so on. And the second thing that I think we need is, is a, a sequence of courses that can uh, meet the needs of graduate students from across the campus that's going to give them the basics of this sort of thing. So I'm sorry we ran out of time, but nevertheless, you've got some snapshot of what people are thinking about, but we really appreciate if people would send us ideas about what you think is needed on campus and how we could make this happen, because I think it's very important to do that as we go forward. And I want to thank the panel for, for uh, putting up. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we got a five minute repeat, which is really great. <laughs> you got a great panel here. So, do people have questions or suggestions or things that they would like to see? So since you mentioned uh, undergraduate education, uh, I work at the VA, but I go to the Science and Engineering Library a lot, and I see undergraduate students using Texas Instrument calculators, and they're drawing benzene rings instead of querying, you know, chemoinformatics databases. I'm just curious whether is it should should like the jump from the 20th century to the 21st century only affect like big data, or should it affect all undergraduates working in technical fields in uh, STEM branches? You may have to repeat your question again because I will answer one question. Um, <laughs> that's somewhat in this space. Um, I don't know if you are aware that um, uh, there is a movement going on uh, in, in uh, enhancing computing in education, actually, not only undergraduate, but even before. Um, in, in, as I speak to you, in fact, 13 states have already passed the resolutions requiring some form of computer science training in high school. So, uh, so there is no question in my mind that, that the computer science where it is heading is way beyond just an engineering discipline or, or, or computing discipline, if you will. And computer, computer as a device is long past the driver uh, of, an, of inspiration in what we do, even as researchers. So, so the, the, the question to me is somewhat rhetoric. Should it be broader? And the answer is yes. 
The, the real question is administratively or organizationally, are we better positioned to do that? And again, uh, there is a rhetoric part of that, uh, that, that uh, question. If there were, then we would not be talking about it. Clearly, we are not. Yeah. So we do, we do have, uh, through extension, the, st the undergrad students can come and take what we call our launch program, which is essentially free to them as long as they are in the last year of, uh, of college. And what we see is that we have more of them applying to the program that we can really handle. But the reason is because they want to bridge and get some practical knowledge. And a lot of times is in areas topics like this, but students that are taking economics may want to learn also about business or maybe learn about some other related topic that gives them a very practical angle to what they are doing, which is what they need many times to be employable. I have two questions, comments. One is I encourage you very much to educate your uh, undergrad in the computer science department and, and so forth on data issues because I want to hire them as a scientist than in the sciences because one of my sources of, uh, of uh, undergrad and, uh, workers, so to speak, is exactly the computer science department and, and the like. So that's a great thing. Um, and the second, uh, so that's a good side of the thing of the uh, equation. What I'm having a little bit of a hard time with is with my grad students, because my grad students don't have the time to send them back to undergrad. And so somehow, in the past, it's always been this, this issue of, can I afford to send them take another course? Um, and the answer typically is no. And so I have to figure out some way or the other to teach them myself. And I'm not quite sure, I don't have a solution, it's a problem. And uh, so, here we go. Um, so I can say a few words. So we, we face exactly the same, we continue to face this, exactly the same problem with computational science background. If you just want a student to be able to do computing, uh, simulation, and sort of generate data, it's the same thing. We, we have domain-specific knowledge in physics, chemistry, mathematics, and there's essentially no room to, to create for this new training. And so it's, it's always a compromise. So in math, we gave up one sort of pure mathematics-oriented qualifying exam to allow them to take a, a track through computational science. And you know it, we face that challenge again now that we're trying to decide what is data science. Can you boil it down to a year-long sequence that would at least give the graduate students basic tools? They'd know where to go, at least, to develop more advanced tools on their own. And it, it's just a hard compromise. Yep. <clears throat> So I actually think some of the offerings from SDSC might be relevant here. So the summer institutes were started at SDSC, which were a week long or maybe two weeks at most, um, actually to provide training on, on uh, parallel computing and focus on our resources. But there's also a format that's possible. In fact, we've talked about it, uh, which might be a couple of months of summer training. Um, furthermore, for grad students, postdocs, I would say even faculty, uh, these uh, short, what I call short format courses, one or two day courses on different things, but you package them all together, uh, might be very practical. Uh, I don't know if you caught it, but th there is a business model question. The way we are modeling what I described as the Institute for Data Science and Engineering is where we would actually have a relationship with an organization. So we'd offer this as a package to an organization. Um, well, UCSD is an organization, so I think all we need to do is find a funding model internally that would allow us to fund these kind of short format courses. I one last Sir, question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it better be good then, right? Um, my name is Gary Reichert. I'm with uh, the Rady program here. And um, one of the things I've observed so far today is I've seen you know, just a lot of impressive stuff in terms of your capabilities, assets, and everything else. Um, and I met, saw that you mentioned a bunch of logos like NetApp and so forth. But one thing I didn't really hear much about was your partnerships with some of the big players in the big data space, such as you know, Microsoft Azure or IBM or any of them, and then how you're integrating that into some of your programs. And then, I guess for my own selfish reasons, how we might be able to be able to leverage that as part of RADI. Because it seems to me that that's 
an important element of the go-to-market business piece of all this. Uh, agreed. So actually one of the activities that I'm engaged with is, is actually on benchmarking. So we call it big data benchmarking, which has all the big players involved with it. We can talk offline since we're out of time. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the other thing I want to say about the, again, the training program that we are talking about is we are actually going to do it with industry. So I've been actually talking to folks, whether it's EMC or, uh, uh, you know, or SAS and so on, uh, that some of the modules that we would be teaching would be taught by them. Okay, so if you want to learn a particular tool that's coming from industry, uh, we would actually sort of put a, a stamp of approval on that and you'd through our institute, you'd actually learn some of those industry things as well. So, but I completely agree with you. In fact, a lot of the big data that we're talking about actually is with industry, if not with some of the big science pro projects, and there's a lot of gap in between, right? There's not too many other people who have that. So, so I want to thank the panel again. I mean, we're running over time, but if you have ideas, please pass them on. You can, you can uh, send them on the Twitter account and put them on the big data site, and we will take a look at that. And people who would like to get involved, um, and have ideas about this. I appreciate it. We'd all be happy to talk to you about various aspects. So thank you very much.